So the future of clinical practice would be optimizing health. Molly, welcome to the stage. Round of applause. It's please. a little bit different, actually. Yeah. <laughs> actually that's um, you. So I was welcome. originally going to give a talk on that, but then um, I was recently at UC Davis, where um, we were working on this concept of an ontology of wellness. And it got me thinking, before you can actually turn scientific wellness into clinical practice, you actually need a language for it. You need a system encoded to understand what wellness even is. Um, I, for the first slide, I showed, I'm going to show you three photos, and these are three different libraries that I worked in growing up. One was in the library of my high school, Richwoods High School in Peoria, Illinois, and the second one was um, at the University of Illinois, where I actually worked in three libraries, including the engineering library. And then in medical school, I worked um, on the library committee. So I've been really nerdy about library experiences for a long time, mostly because to me, a library is a place where you can find any information that you could ever imagine wanting to learn about and solve pr a lot of problems. So throughout my experiences in libraries, I was able to um, learn about how to solve medical problems in particular. I'm a physician, and my practice is oriented around optimizing health, and I do a lot of research for my clients. So it's, my practice is very much more similar to house than it is to a doctor in a clinic or a hospital. Um, people pay me to solve really weird um, and rare medical problems, as well as they also pay me to optimize our health. And so I've had to create systems for solving problems that I think are unique um, and are really the, the, central, the central important thing that you should see about this algorithm for medical research is this thing in the center called the MeSH database. And the MeSH database is a thesaurus for all the terminologies for what disease is made of. Um, and I developed this algorithm because it gave me a way to basically reverse engineer any medical problem so I could find the answers. And again, this talk is about ontologies. So the before we can even begin talking about why that MeSH database matters, we should talk about what an, what an ontology even is. So an ontology is this specific, it's this explicit formal specification of a shared conceptualization of a particular domain of discourse. Here we're today talking about wellness, but throughout most of my education, I was taught about illness. And we have these robust illness ontologies. We've got SNOMED, we've got MeSH, we've got gene ontologies, we've got the ICD, we've got ICF, and all of these are designed for solving medical problems. But we are here today to talk about wellness. And we need ontologies for wellness to solve these problems that we have today. We need to limit the complexity of what wellness actually is. We need to organize this industry into something that can be used to solve problems. A wellness ontology would help us with information retrieval, with, do with domain knowledge sharing, and problem solving. And I would argue that we need a shared language of, of nutrition in particular because the greatest problem of our time is our, is our dietary risks. Um, our dietary choices are actually leading to more deaths than any other disease combined. So I would argue that we need, a f we need to figure out how to talk about nutrition and wellness in a systematic way. So healthcare right now, though, isn't doing a great job on chronic disease because it's based on this pathogenic paradigm. Disease is what the system pays for, and the illness ontologies like the MeSH database and the ICD-9, these are designed to serve the healthcare providers and the insurance companies. They're not designed for the patient and the consumer. Um, so the system, to be short, doesn't pay for healthy, nourishing food. It doesn't pay for wellness right now. But it's starting to change. When I go to this, I don't know if you guys all know about PubMed, but when I go to PubMed and I search for wellness, I get the word health. And when you look up the word health, according to the WHO, it says it's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease and infirmary. So why are we calling the healthcare system a healthcare system at all? When is the last time the healthcare system did any of these things for you? And I'm a doctor, so I can say this is honestly true. Um, so I started studying this concept of the illness wellness continuum when I started doing research on what wellness was because to me there was something majorly missing from my education in medicine. I was taught about disease but I was rarely taught about optimizing health. And I learned through my research that all health and disease exist on this continu continuous spectrum. And optimal health is not a destination but it's this continuous process of active participation in a goal-oriented wellness lifestyle. Yet most people are moving in the opposite direction of health. So let's go back 200 years to figure out where this all started. 
Um, actually, it was supposed to be 2,000. <laughs> so if you look in Greek mythology, the ancient Greek god of healing had two daughters. One was Panacea, and one was Hygieia. Panacea believed that treating illness was the way to promote health. And Hygieia, on the other hand, believed that we should teach positive ways of living to prevent illness. And yet somehow, Panacea has led the way. So why is there this focus on disease? Well, the, the, the godfather of wellness, the first man who really wrote a book on it, named Halbert Dunn, he makes a really good point when he says, after all, people want to get well. They want to be free from sickness. But when we're free from sickness, we're rarely interested in becoming more well. Now, I think that that's been the case for a while until very recently. It seems, it seems with technology and with all these wearable tech tools, with these apps, we're now finding a population of people that are so much more empowered to improve their health. And I believe that what's, what's kept medicine leading the way, this concept of empiricism in science, can also be applied to wellness. And technology is enabling us to measure these things. So let's do a couple thought, thought experiments. What would the world look like if we invested half of what we spend on sick care on optimizing the health of our citizens? And what would the world look like if we took the marketing budgets of Big Pharma and invested them into marketing fruits and vegetables? We'd have a very different world, right? <laughs> so there's this paradigm shift happening, fortunately. I don't know if any of you know about the company called Airavail or Lee Ray Hood or Nathan Price, but you should look them up because their company is making a really big shift in this industry. Um, they're creating this concept of scientific wellness. And what I love so much about these guys is that they're hard scientists that are applying hard science to optimizing health and to this concept of P4 medicine, which is personalization, participation, participation prediction, and prevention. This is basically the, where I hope, and I'm, I'm hoping a lot of people see the future of medicine going. Instead of just treating disease and reacting to disease, let's predict it before it happens, and let's get people to participate in staying well instead of getting sick in the first place. Um, so pervasive computing technologies are amazing for this, for this purpose, because we're now going to be able to have all these sensors on our bodies that will give us a tool and an, ident an ability to identify when things are going wrong. A good friend of mine, Ryan Howard, has a company called FirstBeat, and it's basically a monitor for um, early cardiac events and for heart, heart arrhythmias. I think with technology, we're going to be able to give ourselves so much more insight about what's going on inside our body, and we're moving healthcare outside the hospital. We're decentralizing it. People are managing their health more than ever, and we're getting them to participate, which is extremely important for avoiding illness. But there's still a lot we do not know about how to get to optimal health. So how do we move this needle into the future? How do we enable wellness with data? How do we start defining what is wellness in the first place? Well, we need a language. We need a shared language so we can all talk about the same things, so we can measure these things, so we can understand what we're all talking about. We need a wellness ontology, in my opinion, to classify an individual's level of vitality, thriving, and well-being, and the skills associated with wellness and higher functioning, to come to a consensus of what wellness is. And this could be used for a lot of reasons. It could be used to identify empirical correlates of health and quality of life and longevity, and for many different social reasons as well as individual reasons. So where does wellness lead us? Well, it leads us, I hope, to self-actualization for every individual. For, for people having more of their needs met, I mean, the base of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is our food and it's our physiology. And because I believe that a lot of people, if they knew that there are ways to develop their strengths, would actually want to be more well. If there was a way for us to measure how to become even better versions of ourselves, and if there was a way for, we could get, for us to get that from the healthcare system, a lot of people would seek that out. So where do we begin when building something like this? Well, I just started looking at existing wellness research, and I just found a lot of research in psychology, believe it or not, but I found almost no research in empirical correlates of, of wellness. I found wellness ontologies for personal health care, for, for personal health records, but we all know that Google Health failed, and nobody wants us to keep a personal health record for the sake of record keeping alone. Uh, there's also some papers on personal health ontologies for wearable tech, which I think people should, quit, should look at. Um, so we need to begin thinking about creating a, a joint thesaurus and mapping all these relationships so we can come up with a new meta model. 
These are some of the existing ontolog ontological systems that I found, but again, they're mostly for psychology. And psychology is important, but we also need it for physiology. We need it for lifestyle markers. We need it for environmental markers, for healthcare system markers, as well as for the experience of occupational health. This is one example um, of one researcher's context-aware and trust-based personal wellness information framework for pervasive health. And I would argue that a lot of people here are creating frameworks for pervasive health technologies, for wearable technologies, for apps. So I would look at this paper. This is the title of the paper. I would look it up because it's an excellent starting point. But realistically, we're going to have to build an ontology for every aspect of well-being. And that means for activity, for nutrition, for weight, for sleep and stress, for risk factors, for the individual's experience of, of quantifying their weight, their gender, their work preferences, their goals, as well as for context. Context is everything when it comes to changing behavior and for different events in people's lives as well as for the source of information. So we have a lot of work to do. And UC Davis is actually the place that I would look um, because they have started writing fitness ontologies, they've also started writing food ontologies, and um, I'm hoping to work with them on a, a greater construct of a wellness ontology. Because biology is really complex. <laughs> and if we have this amazing system for quantifying disease, for genomics, for um, physiology, we need the same system to quantify what is optimal health. We need, to, I, we need to stop thinking about things in the context of what's wrong with us, and we need to start focusing on the context of what's right with us. And we need to be able to define what right is so that every individual has places and goals that they can set for themselves in their lives. And I'm here to answer any questions. So, so, so. You, you run with the mic. Good. Time for two questions. Wellness ontology. <laughs> no questions. I, I've got a comment. Okay. So th this strongly aligns to what, what, what we discussed earlier, which is as all disciplines progress towards a, a science, they go through natural stages of evolution. The first one being categorizations of phenomena, ontology. Second one being correlation. And right. the third one being cause and effect. So this morning we heard all kinds of um, discussions about um, people building uh, correlation and cause-effect models. Do you feel that this space, in some ways, is, is they're trying to run ahead of this? The, the um, uh, yeah, but without without having this this basis of, of mm -hmm. an ontology, then do those activities really are they are they kind of futile? Where, where do you see this going? Well, so I've been involved with the technology sector for the health technology sector in particular for about four years now. And one of the things that I, I said in the very beginning when I started working with companies was, guys, you need to at least do some homework on the research before you start trying to make a solution to a problem. Yep. But yet, we have so many engineers that are trying to look, they're reverse engineering the problem, right? So yep. I, I'd say that um, one, of the, one of the bigger concerns I have is that People are trying to reverse every problem and they're forgetting to talk to each other because they feel like they have to keep all their information to themselves because they have some sort of, um, you know, they, they want to keep their special sauce to themselves. But I would, I would argue that it would be better for everyone if we were all having more of a public discourse about defining what wellness is because I think that there's a huge disconnect between this concept of psychology of wellness and physiology of wellness right. and the genomics as well. And, um, and maybe, maybe we all need to make a consortium around this or something, but um, I, would, I would say, you know, look, look to researchers. There's a lot of people in academia and there's a lot of doctors who want to contribute to making your products better. And so hire some really great advisory board members who can bring their expertise to you and, and people who've been doing this for a long time because they usually have an existing language that they can share. Right, so having a proprietary language ultimately is a very isolating activity. Well, it's isolating and, and, and it turns out it could be wrong. Yeah. You know, like you might think you know how to define what stress is, mm -hmm. but it, there might be a researcher who's been spending 20 years of his life studying it, and if you sit and try to define stress on your own without looking at it from a perspective of like, what is the existing literature that exists and who are the experts in this area, um, you could be re trying to reinvent the wheel that, already, that, that maybe already exists somewhere and you could actually save yourself a lot of time. Okay, so what I'm hearing from you is a, a tension here between the need for revenue models and a, a thing that's enclosed and proprietary versus a, a shared common basis in which we have to create an ecosystem and, uh, um, and shared value of the industry. 
Yeah, I mean, so I've, I give lectures to physicians all the time about technology and how to implement into the practice. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that they all say is, well, we can't possibly add this to what we're doing because there's no research. But then I argue to them that, you know, the technologists want to do research, they just don't have enough of you helping them do it, right? So um, we, we need to actually transform the system from going from, it takes currently 17 years for something in research to go, into, to go actually into a technological solution. That needs to shift. We can do both at the same time and move faster together. Great. Molly, that was fascinating. Thanks. Thank you very much, really appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat>